Hello, welcome to a new edition of the Euro Questions, our series of webinars where every fortnight we present the Jacques Delors Institute's research and discuss European news. Today, we are very pleased to greet Daniela Schwarzer, Executive Director for Europe and Asia of the Open Society and member of the Jacques Delors Institute's board. Daniela Schwarzer is a former director of the European Integration Department of the German Council on Foreign Affairs, and she has kindly accepted today to discuss with us the new German coalition and its new government under Chancellor Olaf Scholz. This new government describes itself as pro-European and promises to work hand in hand with Paris. But there are still concerns and questions from European capitals about the repercussions of this new progressive German coalition on European social, environmental, and economic policies. It is more precisely these issues that we will discuss today in order to understand more acutely what to expect from Germany's European policy in the coming years. As always, I would like, you to, rem I would like to remind you that the Q&A tool is available at the bottom of your screen. I will submit your questions to our speaker in the second part of this 30-minute webinar. I wish you a very good Euro questions, and without further ado, I leave the floor to Daniela for her presentation. Thank you very much, Mathieu. Thank you for having me. And thank you to all for joining us um, at, uh, for this lunch uh, discussion, which, which is short, and I hope we will get a lot of stuff covered. So let me start by saying that, in my view, this new coalition is good news for Europe. Um, this is a German coalition which does not shy away from big questions of European integration. The coalition treaty very clearly mentions that Europe may need to move forward towards a more federal Europe. The word is actually there. And there's also a recognition that maybe the incremental way of moving European integration forward that we have seen over the past years since the Treaty of Lisbon uh, was, was uh, ratified, that this method may actually have reached its end, meaning there is an openness to actually think about treaty change, maybe even an intergovernmental conference, which would mean a really substantive treaty change. So with that ambition level, um, the question is what precisely would Germany under this new political leadership of three parties, meaning the Social Democrats in the chair of the Chancellor, uh, Olaf Scholz, um, and then two smaller coalition parties, the Greens as the second largest party covering in particular the Foreign Affairs Ministry, and uh, the Ministry for the Economy and Climate, which is an important and big ministry in this coalition. And then the Liberals, who also have one key ministry that is really essential for European affairs, the Finance Ministry. So how does this coalition very practically take European affairs forward and, and what is to expect? Let me first very briefly look at Olaf Scholz as Chancellor. I remember a few weeks ago and a few months ago, there were so many discussions about what would happen to Europe uh, once Angela Merkel as the outgoing chancellor at the time, what happens once she has left? Would, would Germany still be the same? Would European affairs go forward? There were a lot of very serious articles and discussions on the question of what happens if that person who has been a key pillar of European negotiations and a real heavyweight in the European Council for 16 years once she has left. I think if we reflect on this observation and then Olaf Scholz as a person and also his track record as a policymaker, I think there will be substantive continuity. He has built his whole campaign on continuity. He has tried to be the candidate that presents the least disruption to Merkel, and he has succeeded. Although obviously uh, the leadership, uh, the chancellery swung from the Christian Democrats to the social Democrats with his election. Um, what does that continuity mean? First of all, it is continuity in style. He is a very, uh, calm and cautious policymaker. You would rarely see him loud or pushy, hardly ever, I would say. He is someone who negotiates also um, in the background, who tries to build consensus and bring things forward. 
incrementally, which I think is one of the major qualifications of a German chancellor when that person wants to be successful in European affairs, because Germany cannot move Europe forward successfully if it does so by merely demonstrating its power of the economy politically, you know, and so on. But it's really by, by building consensus and convincing of ideas that may be brought to the table. The second point of continuity that I see in Olaf Scholz is um, that he actually will pick up one of the major issues that were, um, or the, the, the major achievements that were built in the last year of, of, of Merkel's chancellorship. Um, and that was mainly the recovery fund that was decided upon in summer 2020. Olaf Scholz was the finance minister and vice chancellor at the time. That has two important um, dimensions. One was he worked very closely with France on the recovery fund. And he also very closely worked with Merkel in bringing along the German parliament and public to support this big leap forward in European integration, which I see it is, and we can discuss whether you would agree. But this ability of Europe to put something together uh, as a crisis instrument in a very short amount of time, that actually is really a change into what Europe has at, at its disposal in terms of um, financial instruments. The fact that it, the EU now goes to the market and borrows money in a very, very high uh, range of, 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 of 750 billions of euros, but then also the way the money is spent and that Germany accepted that, that it is both loans, um, but it is also transfers. This was an important achievement um, of the EU, of Franco-German relations as the uh, sort of core that, that built that consensus first. And Olaf Scholz was a key person in that. The story goes in Berlin that he actually worked with the French and convinced the chancellor that this was the right instrument. And if that is true, and there may be some truth to that, it means that he will not completely have left behind that logic. And while in Berlin, the, you know, the, even with that new government, the story goes that the recovery fund and the, the sort of the, the big package, that has its natural end. The instruments that have been used and the path dependency that has been created actually opened the space, in my view, for a rather substantive and, and important discussion on the future fiscal and financial framework of the European Union going forward. Now, will he be alone in carrying those ideas in the German government? Certainly not. The Greens are very supportive. Um, they also are very open to the debate that is also coming our way in next spring, uh, which is the reform of the stability and growth pact. So the fiscal rules that govern uh, the Euro area. The Liberals are a question mark, of course. Um, they are known for economic liberalism, for a strong hesitant hesitancy to build a too big European budget. Uh, they are certainly among those in German uh, politics who argue all the time that the Eurozone shouldn't be too much about risk sharing and actually sharing the burden of existing debt. That's a complete taboo. So mutualizing existing debt is, is no option with this government. Um, but the liberals also know that both the EU, but also Germany uh, has a very strong investment need. And when you look at it from a, you know, not a political, but, but a finance perspective, and you ask yourself, how can you best raise the money for trans-European projects, um, for instance, in the field of infrastructure, in the field of research, in the field of tech and digital, that are, those are all important liberal topics. Then the question is, how do you, you know, best go to the markets? Do you do it as individual countries or do you do it together? And the experience of the past now one and a half years clearly show that uh, the EU raising money and the markets has been very successful and the conditions have been very good. So there is a way, in my view, that also the liberals 
buy into an initiative which may lead the European Union to, after the, the recovery funds period of time, uh, actually do more for joint European investment with tools that are currently now being tested. I've also mentioned red lines in passing, and that is clearly debt mutualization. And here it is not only the politics of the coalition, uh, it is definitely also the opposition in parliament because the opposition today is led by the Christian Democrats who are fiscally conservative. You will all remember Finance Minister Schäuble and his approach towards both the question of Eurozone architecture, uh, but also the handling of the sovereign debt and banking crisis after the year 2010, in particular his approach towards Greece. This approach had broad backing within his party and it will continue to do so. Um, and the other opposition party, which we need to look at when we need to understand what this new government will be facing in terms of domestic debate on Europe, is of course the uh, Alternative für Deutschland, which is a far right EU and Euro skeptic party, uh, also uh, absolutely migration skeptic and xenophobic, but they will focus on uh, the forward leaning agenda of this coalition, in particular also in that field of, of, of finances and, and fiscal rules. So this is what the government will be up against. And I'm putting so much emphasis on these points because in Germany, the parliament traditionally by our constitution plays a big role in, uh, in, in the de definition of EU policy. Our chancellor goes to parliament before every European council and declares uh, now his, previously her, positions that will be taken at the council and gets feedback from parliament. So there's a lot of parliamentary scrutiny. Uh, many European affairs issues have to actually be voted by parliament. Uh, for instance, all the rescue packages in the euro area crisis had to go through parliament. So let me briefly turn to topics that may be more complicated. This government is coming with a very clear green transition agenda. Um, first of all, this is a German agenda, and you know that in terms of energy policy, uh, Germany left uh, the European mainstream years ago after uh, the um, nuclear catastrophe of Fukushima. The decision was taken to leave nuclear energy um, and to basically transition to renewables, but also this meant that, of course, uh, fossil, um, few fossil sources of energy continue to, to have importance in Germany. So our own energy transition is difficult. Um, from a German perspective, uh, you know, the European energy mix in the, in the medium term would better be without nuclear, but we already know how big our problems are within Germany. Uh, so uh, European agenda, which is anti-nuclear is, is obviously very hard to imagine and no German policymaker would defend that. But one of the very tricky issues that is related of course to energy provision and, and here we see a very clear intersection of um, energy policy and geopolitical and even security policy is the question of Nord Stream 2. The new government has come in with a very critical position on Nord Stream 2, not so much the chancellery because the SPD traditionally has an attitude towards Russia, which consists in saying we need dialogue, they are our neighbors, although we are critical of everything that happens in Ukraine or elsewhere. There is a, in, in some politicians at least who, who set the tone, a stronger readiness to actually say we need dialogue first, we shouldn't be confrontational. Now the Greens come with a very different position. Uh, the new foreign minister, whom we have Annalena Baerbock, um, throughout the campaign and also since she is in office, and this has only been a week now, um, she has been emphasizing that she does not see that Nord Stream can actually move into functioning uh, at the beginning of 2022 which from a technical perspective is possible. Right now it is held up by an agency which doesn't clear the pipeline, but of course there needs to be a political discussion and decision how this new German government really looks at Nord Stream 2 in an increasingly difficult situation. And here, you know, um, sorry, Mathieu, I'm not only discussing European policy because this topic 
as a very important transatlantic dimension. Um, the Biden government, but also the US Congress is extremely critical of Nord Stream uh, with the threatening of, of sanctions and a very clear signal to Germany that one of the tokens that Europe could throw onto the negotiation table with Russia as the attempt is being made to de-escalate the situation with uh, Russia at, um, on the eastern border of Ukraine, where we have this enormous troop buildup, could be to actually say that um, putting Nord Stream into practice would be dependent on how Russia uh, behaves and re actually has to retreat from the border of Ukraine. So the pressure on, on the German government in that regard is very high. And I do believe it is a really European issue because what we have to develop as Europeans together is a European strategy towards Russia. And in my view, this is lacking because no one has a very clear idea how to actually have any opportunity, uh, any chance at all to move Russia into a more constructive space where we can have a more peaceful situation on our uh, Eastern neighbors borders. Uh, and have less Russian disturbance within the European Union. And the price that Russia is asking for is unacceptable to Europeans basically saying no, either to uh, Ukraine's membership with a NATO uh, or uh, you know, giving up any perspective for Ukraine to, to come closer to the European Union, let alone membership. So the new German government will be very much challenged as a European player to bring forward and to push alongside the high representative, Joseph Borrell, and of course, other key players such as uh, the French president and the French presidency needs mentioning as well, uh, to bring Europe into the position to have a joint position on Russia, but also on China. The foreign minister, Annalena Baerbock, emphasizes very clearly the importance of human rights and pushes forward the understanding in Berlin that future German foreign policy should be more values-based, which of course is a thing you know, many, many people subscribe to, but when you then look at the feasibility and the way to implement this, which would mean you would have to be more ready to actually sanction violations of human rights, for instance, by economic means, um, then you very quickly come to the point where you have to realize Germany's economic model is fundamentally built on openness and that not only includes our European partners, but also very, very close relationships with, with China and with Russia, meaning energy policy, trade, investment in the case of China, uh, technology partnerships and all that, they are inbuilt into the German success model. And if you wanted to have a foreign policy uh, that actually puts an emphasis on, on other issues like human rights, you must be ready to take an economic hit and to actually pay an economic price. And this is where the jury is obviously still out, um, whether the German government that has come into office now is ready to pay that, and how Germany can mobilize Europeans towards a clearer and more adamant strategy vis-a-vis -vis China, which from a foreign policy perspective and a green perspective as that part of the government, they clearly want to have. Uh, if you would ask the liberals, while they completely subscribe to the normative base, they do have uh, sort of the corporate interest more on their minds than maybe the Greens at this point. But I think the reality check will be very quick and very soon. And we will see how, how Germany actually lands and then takes a role in Europe. Um, just a few last words before we come to the questions on the Franco-German moment, which I see we may be facing, and this is good news. Um, France takes the French EU presidency uh, at the beginning of January. Um, the German government has shown that it wants to be very supportive of a French success. We all know that this will be a de facto rather short presidency, not because the calendar is not running for six months, and of course France will be presiding all the ministerial meetings, but as French elections are coming up in April and May of 2022, um, the French uh, leadership, Emmanuel Macron, um, and his closest, um, his closest uh, partners in, in government who will be involved in the electoral campaign, 
uh, are of course uh, in a difficult position of heading the EU presidency at the same time. So we can expect the first three months up to March being the most important ones for the French EU presidency on that top political level. And then of course the chairing of, uh, of the uh, ministerial councils and all this will continue. Um, the good news is in my view that France and Germany coordinated over the past month very well, not to repeat something that happened four years ago uh, when the last German government negotiated its coalition treaty and Emmanuel Macron decided to give a big speech on Europe at the Sorbonne and actually launched a lot of ideas that no one in Berlin was in a position to answer because there was no government and coalition negotiations were ongoing. And this is something really serious when it happens in Germany. So people are completely shut off and in their own world when they negotiate that treaty, which is really a detailed work program for the government. Now, this, this time it didn't happen. The speech came after this. And what we saw over the past days was really very high level visits from Berlin to Paris, then to Brussels, then to Warsaw, the foreign minister, the chancellor. Um, and they all come with a mission to basically uh, show that there's a new European momentum and that they seek very close Franco-German cooperation. France did not table some of the issues that are really dear to France, like the reform of the Stability and Growth Pact at a point in time where it would have been complicated for the German electoral campaign or the incoming government to handle. So this will be an important issue in the first half of 2022. And that's very good that it's then it has to happen. France and Germany will come from different positions, but I think they will manage their way to negotiate a compromise with the others, of course. So I think there we are in rather you know, good waters. The big issue that will come up during the French EU presidency is the conference on the future of Europe, the results of which will be published in May after, uh, or just before, I'm not sure, but, but in the sort of around the second round of the French presidential election. So the big challenge for the EU as a whole, but also for the French EU presidency, and I would say for the German government as being the largest country in the EU, is to take those results seriously. And this brings me back to my very first point as a conclusion. With this big ambition in the coalition treaty to really think the future of Europe and move towards a more integrated Europe, there is a clear opportunity for leadership here for Germany. Because if the Conference on the Future of Europe presents ideas and results that actually require a rethink of some parts of Europe, maybe less Europe in some areas, but more ambition in others. With regards to the, with regards to the coalition treaty, the government is clearly set up to embrace this and take this forward. I think that's really the, the strategically good decision they made to open that space. Um, what Germany will always face is its domestic constraints, which I have shared with you how the opposition looks, but also we have a constitutional court that very keenly observes that no constitutional principles are violated, which sets very clear limits with regards to the deepening of the Eurozone, and you've probably all followed uh, previous constitutional court rulings. So it's not that everything is open and everything is possible, but I would say with regards to what could be politically possible. This government lands in a good place. It definitely is a pro-European government. And I do see the possibility of a momentum of Franco-German cooperation under the French EU presidency. And both partners will have to make sure they open up and have a very, very intense and thorough dialogue with those countries who risk feel left aside, pushed aside maybe even, and France with its new uh, alliance of cooperation with Italy, while Germany symbolically, this new government went to Poland straight after Brussels, also a big important symbol. The goal of both must be to take the EU 27 along and they both have their particular partnerships and friendships and I think they have to use them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your, for your presentation. So I, I will ask uh, three rapid questions uh, from, from our auditors. Uh, the first, uh, so a few auditors um, talk about uh, the possibility of a treaty change, which you, you've mentioned uh, in the beginning of your presentation. Um, more specifically, uh, the change to the change of the unanimity rule. 
um, the renegotiation of Maastricht, uh, Maastricht uh, criteria, for example, do you think this is something uh, that, that can be expected uh, in the coming years with this new German coalition, or do you think we are still far off? Um, I, I think, first of all, on the stability and growth pact, I have commented, and I, uh, I don't think the Maastricht rules will be changed in the treaty, but the stability and growth pact, which is based on secondary legislation, uh, that, that is the more likely uh, change that we will see. Um, so it's less about the entry criteria into EMU, which the Maastricht criteria are that have primary law sort of value in the treaty. It's more the secondary law level that I see the change happening on. On uh, the qualified majority vote, um, it has been a German position for quite a long time. This government is even more forward leaning about this um, to extend uh, QMB to the area of foreign policy. My personal opinion is, is, is the following. First of all, you obviously, if it's about um, changing that rule, even if you don't do it through treaty change, you will need unanimity. And there are ways with the existing treaty to introduce more qualified majority vote for foreign policy decisions. You still need unanimity. Um, is this possible? I think the pragmatic way to look at this is um, within the area of foreign policy, it is possible to advance in smaller groups based on the treaty, completely in line with the EU institutional framework. In those groups, you can introduce qualified majority vote. I do believe that will happen. At the moment, I see a low likelihood of introducing qualified majority vote for EU 27 decisions in the area of foreign policy, unless the member states actually identify more or less, I don't want to say marginal issues, but, but some where it's easier to agree, right? Um, that don't touch vital national interests. There, maybe it can happen. But I really think that it will rather go through, um, through this, this uh, alley of, 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 first of all, introducing QMV for a limited group of member states. Um, and then this could have an effect of others joining, but that will be my guess at the moment. But I do believe the government is, is pretty determined to push for that. By the way, it was also a position that the German EU presidency, um, uh, which was, uh, which happened uh, a, good, a good year ago, uh, put forward as, as a position initially when they planned their presidency, but then realized this was difficult also because of COVID coming and, and uh, this kind of slipped off the agenda, but it's a traditional German position. The downside of QMV and foreign policy obviously is if you take an issue to the Council of uh, Foreign Ministers, um, and one country declares it's a vital interest and wants to prevent a qualified majority vote that is possible. And the topic um, or the issue moves up to the European Council where you don't have a qualified majority vote. So the system is able to, even if it's introduced to undo it again in action, um, and we need to bear that in mind. Thank you very much. Two, two final questions. Um, as you know, in France, we don't necessarily have a political talk culture of a coalition. Um, the oppositions and the certain disagreements you've exposed between the parties forming that coalition, does that mean that uh, this coalition might not last? Or do you think these disagreements could, uh, could cause eventually this coalition to break? It's, it's always possible that a coalition breaks. And um, a three-party coalition, by definition, is less solid than a two-party coalition, which is the usual model um, that Germany lands on because of our electoral uh, you know, system and, and so on. However, I see a, first of all, I see a very um, strong chancellor in the sense of he's a real moderator and he will try to balance out those interests and the points that are contentious. But still, I mean, that's behind the question that has been asked and it's rightly asked. There are contentious points. If you compare the positions of all three parties, there are contentious points. And some of the issues will maybe sort of be sidelined and, and, and won't reach the priority that they would have, for instance, in a green red coalition only. Um, but other issues they will have to tackle. 
And one of them will, or is already, uh, the question of, um, of fiscal policy within Germany, where on the one hand, we know we have very clear investment needs. Germany hugely underinvested in infrastructure, in uh, research and, and, and everything that's related to innovative capacity, technology, and so on. And this has to happen. Now, the, the liberals, of course, have a, an understanding of fiscal policy, and they are the sort of the, the party that presents the finance minister, my finance minister, uh, Christian Lindner, who's also the party chairman. So he has a real political base within his party. Um, he will not want tax increases in Germany. Uh, at the same time, uh, the SPD clearly does not want any tax reductions. They want the opposite. Um, so this will be a constant debate, and this will not be only this year. I mean, they have just passed uh, the budget for next year, so this went smoothly. But this topic will be coming back and coming back. And in particular, if we have more effects of the COVID-19 crisis, if we move into another year of pandemic, and we see more uh, sort of economic pressure coming back. Right now, Germany is in a good position, but this may change. I think this whole topic of, of, of debt and deficit within Germany will be important. Um, and obviously this European debate, which we've already, uh, I've already spoken about, um, this, this can be more tenuous in the years to come. But I would say the way they have managed the coalition negotiations, the way they have presented their result, they are off to a good start. But four years is a very long time. And given the way politics have to, has to react to crisis at this moment, we don't know what was coming. And they will be tested in their ability to navigate difficult situations where quick reactions are necessary and where real solidarity between three competing parties um, is important. And the closer we move to the next date of elections, four years down the lane, obviously, the more they will try to profile themselves vis-a-vis -vis their own electorate, and that can then become tricky. Thank you very much, and thank you for your very complete uh, presentation. Uh, it is now three o'clock, so we are going to close uh, this, uh, this webinar. Uh, I'd like to thank all participants uh, for being with us uh, here today. Uh, the replay to the Euro question will be sent to you shortly. Uh, the next uh, Euro question will be held on January 12th. Uh, with our researcher, Clavi Carneis, uh, who will discuss the issue of a European minimum wage, a uh, topic dear to the French presidency of the European Council. This webinar will be held in French and details are to follow. Thank you very much. And uh, we wish you a very nice afternoon. And until next time, thank you, Daniela.